Psalm chapter 38 and Hebrews chapter 12. Psalm 38 and Hebrews chapter 12. Now, in, Psalm, in Hebrews chapter 12, we have outlines for us in the New Testament the relationship between God the Father and we who are saved by grace through faith. And down here, I want you to start reading, we'll start reading in verse 5. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children, my son, despise not them, thou, the, nor, the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If he endure chastening, God dealeth you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if he be without chastisement, where, whereof all are partakers, then ye are bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh, which corrected us and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily after a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our, our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. And no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised th thereby. Now, the reason I brought that up is in Psalm 38, the author is David. David would be a believer. We wouldn't say he was under the same situation that we are. We wouldn't say, uh, you know, that he was saved by grace through faith, he, but he believed. He was, he was like we are. And the relationship to, to God was very similar to the, what the relationship we have uh, in the New Testament. So when you read this, you have to look at this. These are things that happen to God's children, not the world's children. And as you, as you do that, you know, we started last week, or last three weeks ago, and... Um, we said this is one of the seven psalms that deals with conviction and repentance. And it's very humbling. It's very, it's very personal, as, as well as it should be. Uh, a proper view of sin in the life should always drive us to be humble. And, uh, from, and so I'm going to pick up uh, very briefly in, in verses 5 through 8. This was David's statements about his sin. My wounds stink and are corrupt because of the foolish, my foolishness. Um, he, he viewed his sin as disgusting. Verse 6, I am troubled, I am bowed down greatly, I go mourning all the day long. He viewed, he viewed sin as, as distressing him. Verse 7, for my loins are filled with a loathsome disease and there is no soundness in my flesh. He, he said that he was diseased. Now, pay attention to that word because uh, it'll come up later. Verse 8, I am feeble and sore broken. I have, I have roared by reason of the disquietness of my heart. He was very much disturbed. And then we'll pick up from there. And we go down to verse 9. And we see David's great sorrow in 9 through 14, but we're going to take it in three separate uh, divisions. In 9 through 10, it's spiritual. Lord, all my desire is before thee, and my groaning is not hid from thee. My heart panteth, my strength faileth me. As for the light of mine eyes also, it is gone from me. Uh, God reads the unspoken sorrows of, God, of his own children. 
And you, you mark here in verse 9 and 10, the palpitations of, of his heart, the failure of strength, and the eye that could not focus clearly on anything. Everything was blurry. And so he was defeated. He was in a dark place and lost any sense of victory. It looks like he's sorrowing like a lost soul would, but yet he's still in that sorrow and in, in that pain cries out to Jehovah God. And as you read that, this is probably the worst thing about the hour of conviction when your sins find you out. We know that sin will find us out. And you lose all sense of the presence of God. I mean, you, you have been caught and there's nowhere to go. And, and, and the immediate reaction is God's not here. You know, where, where do I go? What am I going to do? So to me, there's no doubt that the failure of the spiritual had a direct relationship to the physical. And I'll say more about that. So the first, the first here, we see that what he's dealing with is spiritual. The second one in verses 11, 12 is social. My lovers and my friends stand aloof from my sore and my kinsmen stand afar off. They also that seek after my life lay snares for me and they that seek my heart hurt speak mis mischievous things and imagine deceits all the day long. Now I want to be very careful here. Um, pay attention. No one wanted to be around him. I mean, every, everybody was, it's, it's not like he wanted to be around anybody, but it, it doesn't say that. No one wanted to be around him. Now, what kind of condition was found in Israel that caused other people to flee from the one that had this condition? Leprosy. Absolutely. Was it leprosy? Maybe, perhaps, but I'm not going to say that dogmatically. But there are things that are mentioned here. If you go back to Leviticus in 13 and 14, and it talks about leprosy, that are very similar. Now, you don't prove fact by similarity. So don't go around and say, David had leprosy. If he had leprosy, I have a tendency to think that he became leprous, and then God would have said so. Uh, it could have been a temporary similarity, but then again, I don't know. I don't want to draw something from uh, an area that I can't back it up. So people surrounded themselves with those who despised David and spoke unimaginable things about him, seeking to, to destroy him totally. So hold your place here. I'm going to make a comparison. Matthew 26. Matthew chapter 26. So where we picked up, I mean, we can pick five, six, seven, and eight as well. But when you pick up in verse eight, nine, 10, 11, uh, and when you come to verse 12, they are they're very descriptive. So Matthew 26, look at verse 56. But all this was done <clears throat> that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled then all the disciples forsook him and fled. Now, I think there's a sense whereby David represented a tiny portion of what the Lord had to pay for our sin debt. All the things that were mentioned there, the Lord paid for them in full. Our sin debt, yours, mine. As a way of dealing with some of the common effects, realized and having to be taken care of in repentance. He did that. I mean, there was way more than this, but I think it still could be part of this. And then, and then lastly, in verse 13 and 14, we see that it's silent. So we see it's spiritual, it's social, but it's also silent. 
But I as a deaf man heard not, and I was as a dumb man that openeth not his mouth. Thus I was as a man that heareth not, and in whose mouth are no reproofs. So the immensity of his sin had left him deaf and dumb in God's presence. What could he say? He had nothing to say. He was stopped in his tracks, including his mouth. He was, he was simply dumb. I don't, mean, I don't mean that in stupid sense. Uh, so as you read this, and I said this is personal, and, and you have to, to make this personal, I think you, we need to be sure, like David, like you and like me, never expected anything like this when he or we first started playing around with sin. You never thought it would ever come to that. David never thought it would come to this, ever. He's the king. Kings seem to have license to do things that common people didn't. So, again, be sure your sin will find you out. And it found him out. Now, we switch gears through the rest of the chapter. We see David's supplications to the Lord. And the first one is found in 15 and 16. For in thee, O Lord, do I hope. Thou wilt hear, O Lord, my God. For I said, hear me. Otherwise they should rejoice over me. When my foot slippeth, they magnify themselves against me. So his first supplication, his first prayer was, hear me. Don't you want the Lord to hear you when you pray? All right. There are, there are many complications that keep him from hearing you. One is if we condone sin in our life. And again, the, the, key, the, the key there is the sin. If you don't take care of the sin, how can you expect the Lord to hear you? So he calls on the only one who could help. A merciful God, a gracious God, and an able God. And he's saying, if you don't hear me, the enemy is going to rejoice over me. And while my foot slipped, they magnify themselves against me. The slipping of the foot was almost like a state of despair. Go to Psalm 73. This is ASAP. A psalm of Asap. So we're not dealing with David again, but we see the same terminology used. Psalm 73. Verse 1, Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slept. I, 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 was, I was falling away. For I was envious of the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And then he goes on and he describes all the things that the wicked were doing and nothing was happening to them. And the believers were having all these things happen to them and couldn't figure it out. And then you, you go through this, the psalm and he goes to the house of the Lord and then that's where he sees their end. You know, you have come to the right place to see the end of the wicked because it's right here in God's word. And so we don't have to be, you know, work of troubles that they don't seem to have anything happening to them. Everything that if we've mentioned so far does not happen to lost people because God, God is not their father. He's their creator. He's not their father. We could, we could try to identify this, this psalm nationally in prayer but our nation is not a Christian nation. Our nation has turned its back on God. And now we're, we're reaping what we've sown over all this time. And I think the only thing holding it together is people like you and me, the believers. And, and you know it's, it's going to come against us eventually. But let's pray that the Lord comes before that. Uh, and gets us out of here and let them have their way, you know. So hear me. Yeah, I, I, if I pray, I want the Lord to hear me. Uh, I want him to, to answer my prayer. 
Okay, then the second one, verse 17 and then verse 18. Uh, Lord, heal me. For I am ready to halt, and my sorrow is continually before me. For I will declare mine iniquity. I will be sorry for my sin. Confession to God and repentance. That is needed to get the real problem somebody faces to overcome it. Without it, you're, you're just, you're just going to be beaten to a pulp. I mean, the, the Lord might, might as well take you home because you're no good. Heal me. And there really are some sicknesses that are caused by sin and they call for a spiritual diagnosis and solution. So let's look at the, the diagnosis and the solution. First John chapter one, verse nine. First John chapter one, verse nine. My first experience with first John one, nine was not pretty. I was a young believer. I was in a Christian ethics class. I was sitting where Joel's sitting because I didn't want to be distracted by anything going on behind me. And uh, the teacher said, turn to 1 John 1, 9. And so we all, all read it as he read it. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then he said, it's not a blanket statement on forgive my sins, but a specific sin and another specific sin and another one. And I just, I could, I could feel my, my face turning red, probably the veins of my neck. And then I was thinking, who are you to tell me that, you know, I've got to do this specifically in order to be right with God? Well, that's what it's saying. It's exactly what it's saying. If we confess our sins, which has to do with naming the sin and, and repenting of it, then we have the promise. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So there's a solution there for the problem. Had David not confessed and repented, he would have been consumed and destroyed. He said something that I rarely hear anymore. I am sorry for my sins. I don't know what to make of that. All I have to, all I have to go on is the scripture here and in, in, in Hebrews 12. And if I look and compare scripture with the life and the direction God deals with us. Have you ever been taken out to God's woodshed? And you knew that you were being disciplined by God for something that you had just had not taken care of? And if you, do, if you were, and you knew that you didn't want that to happen anymore, then certainly you would have taken care of the problem instead of letting it go that long. This was not written after David's incident with Bathsheba and the killing of her husband. This was long after that. And what he had done was nothing. And it just kept building and building. And all of this is, is taking place against him because he never came to verse 18 until now. I declare my iniquity, I will be sorry for my sin. Heal me. And then at 19 through 22, here's the third thing, Lord, help me. Verse 19. For, uh, but mine enemies are lively and they are strong. And they that help hate me wrongfully are multiplied. They render also evil for good 
for mine adversaries. They also that render evil for good are mine adversaries because I follow the thing that good is. Hey, by the way, uh, maybe this isn't true of you. I have made more enemies after being saved than I had before I was saved. I never did anything good before anyway, but do you understand what I'm saying? We're, he's doing good and, it, and they're calling it evil. Just like today. We're doing good and the world is calling this evil. The lost are calling this evil for doing good. And he looked, and what is he saying? Do you see the, how they're multiplying? And, and he's looking in 19 and 20, he says, Lord, consider my condition. The condition that I'm in. If you if you follow the the reign of David overall, I would say that he was concerned for the welfare of other people. It was not a perfect reign, but it was a good reign. And his detracted detractors hated him even for that. They didn't like when he did right so that which was good. So. I, I look and I say, there's a sense I can take 19 and 20 and make an application to biblical Christianity, maybe some religious groups, uh, and the way that they are multiplying against the truth. The Lord warned us, John chapter 15, John chapter 15. Look at verse 18. If the world hates you, right, what is the world made up of? Lost people. Before you were saved, you were of the world. You were lost. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own because you're not of the world, but I've cho chosen you out of the world. Therefore, the world hateth you. So, the Lord warned us about this. So, our prayers, in addition to being made right with him, should also be for him to consider our situation. We know in, go with 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Hold your place here. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 13, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. Okay, whatever, whatever has happened in your life, the temptation, it's not unique. Maybe unique to you, but it's not unique. If you, if you read what he said, no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. God is faithful. God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be attempted, to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. What's the best time to do that when the temptation comes? All right, so suppose you don't. Well, James chapter 1. James chapter 1. And look down here in verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Consider my situation. The sin, you know, the temptation comes. If you're going to consume it on your lust, you're not going to deal with it. Then you keep going. Eventually, it's going to bring you to the place of death. And when I said 
if David hadn't taken care of this, if there was no repentance, there was no conviction, it would have taken him in death or just, just destroyed him. All right, verse 21 and 22. Here's our last point. Consider my Savior. Forsake me not, O Lord. O my God, be not far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. So God saying, uh, David saying, Lord, you're, you're in the midst of all this. You are my Savior. You are the Lord of my, my salvation. Uh, it's as though he's saying, I, I have no one else but you. I have nothing else but you. And in that, you have everything. And so the salvation he's talking about a lot of times is physical here. And I think there's a spiritual base to it as well. So when we look at our, our life as a believer, in the beginning, it was the Lord. And hopefully today, it's still the Lord. And when all is said and done, it's still going to be the Lord. You've got to determine it's all him. And none of it me. And when these things crop up, when you fall, get back up. What does it say about a just man? Fall seven times, gets back up. What if you fall eight times? Well, then you go to seven, eight to 14. You get back up and, and you, you, you allow yourself to be restored. You, what you don't want to do when you read this psalm is think that, or let it drag out as long as David did before he got it right. Because it works against you every time. Uh, this, this psalm is, is so telling on the difference between saved and lost. Confession and repentance or the lack thereof. The thinking that I can do whatever I want without recourse as a child of God and then suddenly finding out, oh, God is my father, I am his child, and he's going to deal with me according to Hebrews 12, and it's not going to be pretty. And if that's not happening, what does God's word say about those kind of people? They're fake. They're false. They're not real. They're not genuine every time. So be glad that the Lord is this much interested in us living a holy life, a clean life, a life devoted to him. He, want, he wants to make us more like the Lord Jesus Christ, conform to him. And when these things take place, and they're all going to take place one time or another in our lives, then we need, to, we need to immediately confess that to him with the, the idea of repentance toward God, making sure uh, you, you don't want to repeat it. And the, and the, the verse in, in 1 John 1, 9, it says, the Lord is faithful. And we ought to be sorry for our sins. They sent him to the cross. I'm glad he went. I'm glad, I'm glad he bore everything that, that I have done or am doing or will do and pay it in full. But I shouldn't boast of that because even if I was the only person, he would have done it for me. And so we live in a sin-filled world. Uh, one more verse, Matthew 24. Matthew 24. This isn't for, this isn't, I'm going to make an application to today. But as bad as today is, it's nothing like what's going to be in tribulation. So look at verse 12 of Matthew 24. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Iniquity is abounding today, but nothing like it's going to. And still there are Christians that are getting hearts are hard as a rock. You can't let that happen. You just can't. You've got to be sensitive to, to, the, to the Lord, to his leading, to his speaking to us, and, and, and to sin in our lives and dealing with it. 
Psalm 38, great, great chapter. One that is usually skimmed over and avoided or thought, what's wrong with David? Nothing, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with me? To think that, that I can go longer than he did and not have my father in heaven take care of me in such a way that I'm very uncomfortable. And we don't want to do that. So praise the Lord for, for what's there and now put it to use. So let's pray. Our Father, <clears throat> we thank you that you are our Father through faith in Christ and that you deal with us as your children. We do not have a free pass, a free pass to sin. The world seems to have a free pass today, but we know they, don't, they won't in eternity. You want us to be faithful. You want us to be consistent. You want us to be diligent. You want us to be obedient. And to that end, we have to know what you expect of us and what you will do if we do not take care and examine our hearts before you and confess our our sin to you and repent of what we're doing. I don't, I don't wish spiritual calamity or physical sickness due to unconfessed and repentant of sin on anybody. But there's something here that takes place that if we're going to challenge you you win every time, and we lose every time. So be with us in this and encourage us to move forward, move on, and, and get the victory. Not just one victory a day. It could be a hundred victories per hour. There's all kinds of things that are out there to throw us off and to take us to places we never thought we, we would go. So speak to our hearts uh, for the remainder of this night and hopefully beyond that. Uh, give us a good safe trip back home and give us a good rest of the week and maybe live for you, honor you, glorify you in all that we do and be able to tell other people about the Lord Jesus Christ and, and who he is and what he has accomplished in his death, burial, and resurrection. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.